My name is Matt Roach, and I'm a professor of radiation oncology and urology at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm going to talk about radiation for prostate cancer, and I'm going to try to um, keep it as simple as possible. Radiation has been used to treat prostate cancer for more than 100 years, and it's used to treat a variety of cancers with cure, everywhere from the head and neck, uh, brain tumors, lung cancers, breast cancer, gynecological cancers, and it's very effective. The side effects of radiation everywhere are related to the dose and the volume that are received. And so the advances that have occurred over the last um, hundred years have mostly been about being able to more accurately um, align the radiation and uh, minimize the dose to surrounding normal tissue. Uh, the technology has evolved and I will share with you um, some slides here, just a few. We basically either use linear accelerators. This is an example of a linear accelerator here. Or we use um, brachytherapy, which involves, the term brachytherapy refers to placement of seeds directly in a target. Or we use something like a cyber knife device, which is a essentially a linear a compact linear accelerator mounted on a robotic device that allows us to use hundreds of beams to deliver radiation accurately while tracking uh, the patient. When we do radiation, we try to maximize the dose to the prostate and minimize the dose to surrounding normal tissues. And this is an example on the left of a, of a cyber knife treatment and on the right, high dose rate brachytherapy, which is also called a temporary implant. In distinction to a permanent implant, where we place radioactive seeds in the prostate and leave them there. The temporary implant involves placing catheters in, connecting it to a robotic device, delivering the radiation, and then pulling the catheters out. Again, the complications are related to the dose and volume. What we've tried to do with the cyber knife is to recreate the same dose distribution and give the same doses that we would get with brachytherapy, but you don't need to have the anesthesia and you don't need to have all of the needles stuck in the prostate. So for some of my patients, this is preferable. It has been compared with IMRT. I think this comparison is a little bit dated because the uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy that I use that term interchangeably with cyber knife because that's the type of machine I use, but you can use a linear accelerator instead, um, is more convenient for patients. We used to use 40 treatments with IMRT, and now I use four or five treatments with the SBRT, stereotactic body radiotherapy. So it's a lot uh, more convenient for patients. And it's actually much less expensive. The acute side effects tend to be slightly higher because you're giving a high dose in a short period of time. But I think that long-term, uh, the side effect profile is similar. And in patients who are obstructed, that is patients who have a locally advanced disease and are having trouble voiding, I really prefer um, SBRT as the treatment of choice. Now, there's been a proliferation of proton machines around the country, and this shows over time how the, the first, back you know, 20 years ago, there were only a handful of centers, and now there are many. And the question is, are they better? There's no good evidence that they're better. This is a comparison done at Harvard looking at the doses to normal tissues and the prostate, and what you can see, you get a sense that the red area, which is the high-dose area, this is the prostate and the rectum. Um, and, but what you see is the blue is scattered low dose radiation. When you use protons, in this case, they're only using lateral fields, that actually looks like there's more red, but there's a lot less blue. And in fact, the uh, authors concluded that in the range of 6,000 
the IMRT achieved a significantly better sparing of the bladder, whereas the rectum was similar with protons. I'm not going to talk about the um, direct comparisons of surgery versus radiation at this point, except that you have to be careful when you read papers that talk about survival differences with surgery versus radiation because of major differences in patient selection. This is a study that was done years ago where they tried to adju uh, adjust for all the variables that they could. And what you can see is that patients that had radical prostatectomy had a higher survival than people that did not even have cancer. So when you look, when you consider the differences between the two, uh, it's difficult to, um, to really use that kind of information. In the limited number of randomized trials that we have, uh, for example, the PROTECT study, uh, the 10-year survival rates were superimposable, and both surgery and radiation reduced the risk of metastatic disease in a similar fashion. In general, um, continence tend to, tends to be better with radiation. Rectal, injury, rectal irritation tends to be um, lower with surgery. Um, Sexual function is controversial, but I think that uh, it tends to be better with, um, with, with radiation. Um, I think that the single most important piece of equipment and when a patient gets radiated is the doctor and proper use of the technology that people have available. Um, there are many areas where there's controversy. For example, I personally don't use Spacer OAR um, and others do, even at my institution. It is available at UCSF. But if you look at the statistics regarding the complication reduction and the risk, I don't think that the, that the benefits outweigh the risk. And I have serious concerns about the methodology on which the FDA approval is based. In patients who have locally advanced and high-risk disease, we recommend long-term hormone therapy. In patients who have what we call inter unfavorable intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer, we generally recommend short-term hormone therapy, meaning four months. Um, and that hormonal therapy uh, is typically well-tolerated, and certainly for the short term and um, uh, plays an important role in improving the effectiveness of treatment. Again, increased frequency, burning on urination, irritation of the urethra, um, occasionally urinary tract infections, which are easily managed. Uh, these are all common side effects that patients may have. Uh, we recommend aggressive management of erectile dysfunction uh, during the treatment and afterwards. Um, patients tend to respond very well to drugs um, like Viagra um, when they um, have compromised sexual function after radiation. Um, there, again, there's no good evidence that proton radiation is better. Um, I think that brachytherapy and stereotactic body radiotherapy are both at least as good in terms of treatment, but Proton beam radiation may improve with uh, advancements in technology that are being studied now here and elsewhere. Um, it's been a pleasure serving um, UCSF as a radiation oncologist for 30 years now. And I hope that you found uh, my uh, relatively informal commentary to be useful. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Roach. Um, I'd like to first pitch a question to you. And uh, if Dr. Fang is present, we're privileged. And we actually have two radiation oncologists for this session. Uh, but uh, pitch a, a, the first question to you, Mac, that was asked in an earlier section, which is, is BPH a factor in the effectiveness of uh, external beam radiation therapy is there ever a role for a transurethral section of the prostate prior to radiation sort of? And I will add, is there a role for giving hormones in advance to shrink the cancer? So sort of all asking the, the question of volume and how that affects your approach. 
Right. So those are all great questions. You know, I've been accused of never recommending a radical prostatectomy to patients, but that's not actually true. Patients that have very, very strong urinary symptoms or large prostate, we use a metric called the IPSS, the International Prostate Cancer Symptom Score or the AUA Symptom Score. If a patient has severe obstruction due to benign prostatic hypertrophy, I think those patients are better served by radical prostatectomy. Um, so I, we used to routinely give people hormone therapy to shrink their prostate, can, their prostate for BPH if they had obstructive symptoms, but I really don't do that anymore. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's probably not the best strategy. So, so surgery would be a good option for such a patient as opposed to radiation. Okay, and a question just popped up that that sort of sort of the opposite end of the technology. So CyberKnife, is that used for less aggressive tumors only, or would you contemplate that in, in a very aggressive, large, high Gleason score tumor? So uh, as, as monotherapy, that is CyberKnife alone, my threshold is favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer patients. For patients with unfavorable intermediate risk, I usually will add hormone therapy and external beam radiation. So rather than four treatments for a favorable patient, I will give two treatments for an unfavorable patient followed by pelvic radiation. I prefer to do the cyber night first and I have a, that could be a 15 minute talk. It's not gonna be today, but I prefer to, to use combined therapy. Some patients, though I will choose to do only CyberKnife and a short course of hormone therapy after the CyberKnife treatment. Um, so. Got it. So essentially for the, the take home for people is, you know, CyberKnife is very focused. That's its attribute. And if you have to worry about the whole pelvis, CyberKnife is not the way to go at it. You really need to think of, uh, you know, if there's lymph nodes involved. Um, Felix, are you, are you present? I'd like to ask you how you use, uh, to, to tag into your earlier talk, how you use Decipher in clinical practice to decide, uh, for example, who should get radiation with the, with the, sorry, who should get hormones with the radiation? Uh, yeah, Eric, you know, it's a great question. So, um, you know, I, I think if you didn't have Decipher, let's just say, um, so patients with low risk prostate cancer, we don't give hormone therapy to when we give radiation, we just give radiation alone. For favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, if you didn't have Decipher, you would also just give radiation alone. Unfavorable uh, intermediate risk, uh, you would give radiation and hormone therapy for, and high risk, you would definitely give radiation and hormone therapy for. But when I have uh, a Decipher score, um, I think studies, the studies would suggest that the genomic score is probably the most powerful predictor of aggressive disease. And so, you know, all of a sudden, if I have a, somebody who has favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer with a really high decipher score, I'll consider adding on hormone therapy. Conversely, if they have unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, and this is somebody I would have normally given hormone therapy to and their decipher score is really low, I'll be biased against hormone therapy. Again, I always discuss this with my patients um, and this is ends up being a joint decision uh, in, in the setting of kind of me trying to understand the patient preferences and then kind of helping them align their personal preferences to the information at hand. Thank you. Um, Matt, I'm gonna, if you're still present, I'm gonna give you, I have one more question for you and then we'll move on. I'm wondering, Mac, if you could comment. Um, Dr. Carroll alluded to the controversy I'm putting in quotes, the controversy around active surveillance in African-American men. Uh, I'm wondering if you could just give a, your perspective on not just active surveillance, but how, you know, is there, is there, people have talked about adverse outcomes of definitive local therapy in African-American men. How, what's, what's your take on that? That's, that's a great question too. You know, one of the problems with the literature is that everybody doesn't do active surveillance the same way. And so you have institutions like UCSF and Johns Hopkins and places in Canada where people do active surveillance with serial biopsies and MRIs. And there's, there are publications that suggest African-American men are less likely to get an MRI. So we really don't have good data on which to base 
um, you know, a decision about, about that, I would argue that there's no good evidence that the biology is different. Now, there's a review article published by Curtis, Curtis Petaway, who happens to be an African-American urologist from MD Anderson, and he reviewed the literature, and the literature tends to suggest that African-American men are more likely to have progression, but I could explain all of that away based on the quality of active surveillance. 